So, Elena, uh, Lawrenson was talking to us today. Elena was a postdoc at Copenhagen, uh, working on the project she's talking about today. Also, uh, now a postdoc with Rasmus Nielsen here, and here for several months, a year. And next year and a half. Next year and a half. So around for a long time. Very interested in the sort of work we do, but also um, a sort of link up to the Nielsen Lab, which I hope we'll all exploit. So, Elena, welcome. And thanks Thank for you. giving this talk. Um, right, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I, I came down for MVC coffee earlier, and as we walked up, the guys from the group said, what is an ungulate? And someone else said, is that a coffee? And then, so I just want to start off by saying that savannah ungulates um, are hoofed mammals. So, um, Africa harbors the highest diversity of ungulates anywhere on Earth. Um, ungulates is used only as a in a descriptive way, so it's not like a taxonomically significant group, but it's anything bearing hooves, and it includes both uh, animals such as giraffes, zebras, um, warthog, hippopotamus, but also the bovids, which are the true antelopes and the buffalo. So in sub-Saharan Africa alone, over 48 species of ungulates have been described. And this is back in 1998, and now um, there's been a revised taxonomy came out last year, which has pushed up ungulate diversity from 92 to 204 species. So it's very, very high species diversity. So the African savanna biome encompasses the tropical grasslands, the shrublands, and the wooded savannas of sub-Saharan Africa. So it stretches across the continent here, south of um, Sahara. It includes the, the uh, rift valley formation of tropical East Africa and most of southern Africa. Now, angular diversity and biomass is closely associated with the savanna biome, which is in this. And this here is just isoclines of species diversity, again, based on 1998. So now this will be pushed up now with a new taxonomy if this is accepted by the community. And basically, we have high species richness, particularly in East Africa, which I'll come back to. So this here is a graph um, of uh, bovid tribes. This is a million years ago. And this is the first appearance date of bovid tribes in the fossil record. And what we see is many of the tribes that we see today emerged about 2.8 million years ago at the onset of the Pleistocene. Additionally, the past 2 million years have created many of the species that we see today. Now, the Pleistocene in Africa was, um, what happened was that, that the climates generally became drier and cooler. And that prompted the emergence, or rather the expansion, of xeric habitat, such as C4 plant formation, the grasslands. And bovids are, of course, heavily associated with these, as that's important. <coughs> so here we have, again, the grassland savannas as we see them today. They're punctuated by a um, tropical forest belt in Central Africa and some forests in East Africa. Of course, it hasn't always looked this way. Actually, maybe I should start using this. It hasn't always looked this way. If we go back to the last glacial maximum, what we see is it was drier, it was cooler, and we have an expansion of grasslands at um, the cost of the tropical forests. So these were only in a small uh, refuge here in Central Africa, lots of savanna grasslands. If we go back to, or rather if we go forward to the mid-Holocene, we have a very warm, moist event. What we see here is tropical forests expand at um, the cost of the grasslands. So we have grasslands being pushed south and we have grasslands being pushed north. Now for organisms dependent on grasslands, this would really mean um, that they would survive in, um, in different populations. So over time, due both to natural selection and genetic drift, we would expect these to diverge essentially shaping differences in behavior, ecology, and morphology. So this has happened multiple times throughout the Pleistocene. We have shifts between moist, wet periods and dry and cool periods, where we have expansions of savanna, contractions of savanna, and also of the species reliant on savanna habitat for survival. So what I'm going to talk about today is a study that we only just finished where we've reviewed the phylogeographic data that's been published on African ungulates so far. And we have data from 19 different species. So what I'll do is I'll just start off by um, talking a little bit about some of the work that I've been involved in and try and use that 
um, to explain the patterns that we see across all species. So here, these are the, are the six different species I'll be talking about. We've got impala, grants gazelle, eland antelope, that's the largest antelope in the world, um, waterbuck, cob antelope, and if I have time, plain zebra. So, these are population genetic studies and they're phylogeographic studies. They've all been used in different contexts to infer demographic histories and to estimate um, population uh, gen or, or, or demographic scenarios. And a population is a group of interbreeding individuals that exists in time and space. And over time, these may be led to diverge. If, for example, they walk left and right um, of some sort of of barrier to gene flow. So for savanna adapted mammals, that barrier to gene flow could be, for example, dense tropical forests which they can't pass. It might be a mountain or it might be a lake. But for savanna animals, dense tropical forest is enough. For example, the Central African uh, forest of equatorial um, Africa. And what we see, again, natural selection and genetic drift will lead these populations to diverge. As we go out as biologists, of course, we might say, okay, they've diverged so much, they're different ecotypes, we might say they're different species, or we might even say that they're different genera. So the first example, um, basically I'm going to talk mostly about um, what we call Pleistocene refugia. And of course, you, most of you are aware of this. It was a concept originally um, uh, um, used to describe a uh, neotropical forest, but it can equally be applied to the African savannas. And of course, if we have regional structuring, um, it could be, for example, East Africa versus South Africa. And we see this in the eland antelope. So just a bit of trivia about eland. These are quite, how many people here have been to Africa? Okay, fantastic. So if you've ever seen an eland, you can hear their knees click, the males. And the louder the click, the larger the male. So it's a way of the female to see how large the males are relative to the other males. It's quite, it's quite incredible. So what I've got for each of these species studies, I've just shown a map here. This is the present day distribution of Eland, and here we have the sample sites. I'll also show here what kind of marker we have and how many individuals. Now all of these 19 studies have used mitochondrial DNA, and about a third of the studies have also used nuclear DNA in the form of, of microsatellites. So this here is a mitochondrial DNA study. And what we find in Eland is that there is really like serious structuring from East Africa to South Africa. So all of these individuals colored in yellow and red are from the South. All of the individuals colored in blues and greens are from the East. They form a tight parapatric boundary where they meet in Southern Tanzania. There's hardly any gene flow among lineages. We've only got a couple of individuals from um, the East, from what we call the East, which is southern Tanzania, that group in the southern cave. So a very tight parapatric boundary. Some other things of interest, what we see is the southern lineage is older than the eastern lineage. So when we estimate the time of the most recent common ancestor of all the individuals in the south, they're much older than the individuals in the east. Another thing that we also see is structuring in the east that we do not see in the south. Now there are well-supported clades in the south, but they're not geographically structured. In the east, we have much, um, it looks as if it's isolated pockets of individuals that live in populations and don't really intermix that much, despite there not being any barriers to gene flow present, at least not what we know, other than, of course, human activity, but not over evolutionary timescales. So that's just one example where we see segregation between populations in the east and populations in the south. And we actually see this in many species. I have to go back one because I've written here on my notes which other species there are. There's so many I can't remember. We see it um, in a lot of the ungulates. We see it in hartebeest. We see it in giraffe. We see it in even fiscal shrike. We see it in ostrich, four-striped grass rat. And then we also see it in the <coughs> apex predators that, of course, survive by eating the ungulates. So in cheetah and in wild dog, we also see significant structuring between east and south. Right, so this is uh, a, another study, this is on waterbuck. I'm just going to talk a little bit about hybridization. Of course, if you have a barrier to gene flow, be it um, thick uh, coastal vegetation or central African forests, if that barrier to gene flow breaks down, for example, with climate change, you have encroaching savannas, then populations that have been 
um, have diversion <coughs> and hatchery can come into secondary contact. <coughs> now, <coughs> if they haven't diverged very much, they might hybridise. So I'm just going to talk about a, an example of waterbuck. Now, waterbuck are distributed. One subspecies is in the west, goes across to East Africa, and the other one is found only in southern and eastern Africa. They look very different. The Defasa waterbuck has a solid white rump patch. The common waterbuck has like a toilet seat on the back of its rump. And I just, I have to show this one because every time I see this far side, it really reminds me of a common waterbuck. It is just such a common <laughs> But um, <clears throat> what we have is they again have a tight parapatric zone in East Africa, much like the Eden. But here it looks as if this group could have come from the west, this group could have come from the south, they're now meeting as the savannas have expanded in East Africa. And we have hybrid populations, putative hybrid populations. The reason why we think there might be hybrids in, um, this is Nairobi and Kenya, is because of the mixed phenotype. So you've got mixed rotten pattern, which isn't really a toilet seat, it isn't really completely white. So what we did in this uh, study was we used uh, mitochondrial DNA and microsatellites <coughs> to test whether these uh, two subspecies are hybridized. So this is just to show, this is the, the area of interest, this is Kenya. We've got two samples. One of them, I've put a white ring around the sample. This is from Samburu. These guys, these are from Nairobi. And Samburu, it's because we infer, or rather we think they might have been hybrids because somebody once wrote in a diary that we see individuals with mixed bump patterns. So we, uh, use, we wanted to test whether this population was hybrid population or not. So this here is a structure plot just in a different way than how we usually see it. So here we say we've got two genetic groups, either common waterbuck or defasa waterbuck. Each individual, will they fit with the commons or the defasa? And these here are the 90% confidence intervals. And what we see is that all of the defasa waterbuck are not commons. So they group with very low probability in this group here. All of the... Um, Common waterbuck are commons, so they group with very high probability here, also um, quite narrow confidence intervals. But the hybrid <laughs> population, this is Nairobi, definitely hybridizing between the common and the fassa. Even the Samburus, where they, these actually look like commons now, but genetically <clears throat> we can see a signal of hybridization in the past. This is just to show that there are no overlapping 90% confidence intervals between the commons and the Defasa, so it looks as if introgression is limited. It's not genetic material is not moving into the populations. It's it's uh, it's only happening in this um, transition zone between these major phylogeographic lineages. Just another example. This is from Impala. Impala, we see a different, but yet again, some sort of of, of signal of phylogeographic or allopatry that populations diverge in different regions. Here we've got the common impala, it's found throughout East and Southern Africa, it's actually the most common ungulate at all. Um, it's got an M on the back and is known as like a McDonald's because all the lions eat them, they're very easy to eat. Um, and then we've got the black-faced impala, which are only found in Namibia, in northern Namibia in what's called a Tosha National Park. These are morphologically different, we've got the black nose blaze, hence the name, and no black nose blaze. There's also quite large size differences of the two subspecies. Genetically, using mitochondrial DNA, we can see that they are very uh, different. But there is one individual of a black face that groups with the common impala. And we were interested to see, is this because of hybridization? Now, Namibia has a huge game farming industry, um, both for trophy hunting but also for produce. And Namibia looks pretty much like New York City. The entire country is gridlocked with farms that are chock-a-block and that have different species of ungulates, heavily managed. So this here is a Tosha National Park, and these are release sites, these green dots are release sites of black-faced impala. Now only a couple of hundred of individuals survived in Angola and Namibia, and they were moved in the 80s, um, or I think even before that, in the 70s, to Etosha, and they, where they established breeding populations. So the US Department of Interior, because there were so few black-faced impala, they um, basically put down a, um, it, what's it called? It was no longer possible to shoot trophies of black-faced impala for hunters and bring them back into the US. So basically what all these farms did was panic and they bought common impala instead. So these two subspecies have before been um, 900 kilometers apart. 
like Syria's geographic subdivision. But now, Common and Pala were being brought in from South Africa and from Botswana to fill the neighbouring farms of the Pad. So we were interested in seeing, are these subspecies um, hybridising in the pack, and what is the genetic integrity of the black face, the last remaining 1,500 black face in powder in the world? So we used, um, so especially these two, I mean, these are chucker block. The fences are not well maintained, they're very low, and in powder can just gap them. So we um, were especially interested in these two populations. Here we have, again, um, geographical segregation. And what we find, actually, is there's no hybridization going on. So that was fortunate for, um, for the pack. Um, this is just using a baseline population from Chobe. We, didn't, we weren't able to get any of the populations around Atosha, so we had to use baseline populations from the rest of the um, distribution of common impala. But using baseline populations from Chobe, from Shingani, and from Samburu in Kenya, we do not find any evidence of hybridization. So that, at least, is fortunate for the remaining black-faced impala in the Atosha National Park. But anyway, impala, a southwestern group and an eastern southern group. Genetically very different, morphologically very different. Right, so introgression can happen when barrier to gene flow breaks down, populations move, they overlap, and you have the movement of genetic material one way. So going from one population to another population. So I'm just going to show an example here of the cob antelope. So the cob is distributed much like the water buck across Western Africa and then also in Uganda and Kenya, Sudan and Ethiopia. We don't have any cob in Southern Africa, but we do have the puku, which is a sister species of the cob, which is found in this area. So it looks as if there has been some segregation between puku and cob for them to diverge, but also we do see divergence within the cob. So these are the designated, they're three subspecies of cob antelope. They look very different. So this here is the Uganda cob. It's the national mammal of Uganda. We've got the white-haired cob, which is found. This here, the green one here is the white-haired cob. This one is the Uganda cob. Morphologically, they're very different. We've got the males here. They are a pale in the Uganda. They're rich plum with the white ears in the white-haired cob, hence the name. Not only that, they also have behavioral differences. So these guys, you can see they're standing still. These are sedentary species. This is a migratory species. You can see on this picture, they're on the trot. So this actually, this picture was taken by a guy called Paul Elkin from Conservation International, um, who went up to monitor to see whether any of the white eared cob had survived the decimation of the Sudanese Civil War. And they didn't expect to find any. This was in 2007. So they went up and they did aerial surveys. And what they found, or they estimated, was over 850,000 migrating cod. This migration rivals that of the Serengeti Masai Mara. It's incredible how many species or how many individuals move annually. So these are very different. The question is, are they genetically different as well? Oh, the whole point of the story. Notice here, this, this uh, one population, it's Murchison Falls National Park, it's in Uganda, and these, this is a population of Uganda cod. All the individuals look like this. So, Looking at, firstly, mitochondrial DNA data, here we see two segregated groups. One encompasses all the individuals in the west and stretches across and includes a couple of individuals in the east. The other one includes only individuals in the east. Again, we have segregation phylogeographic structuring between West Africa and East Africa. We also see this in other species. We see it in red dica. We see it in things like African common toad. Um, we see it in white-tailed mongoose. And interestingly, we also see the segregation of West and East in what's called the maize stalk borer. <coughs> the maize stalk borer is a pathogen of cultivated crops, C4 plants in Africa. And the evolutionary or the biogeographic signal in the maize stalk borer mirrors that of its wild host, because of course this is over evolutionary timescales and the cultivated plants are a relatively recent event. The maize stalk borer, this pathogen, also shows East-West structuring. It actually also so shows um, east-south structuring as well. So because so many species show the same pattern, it looks as if it's common cause and likely, or what we believe, is an ecological cause as well because of these shifts in vegetation. So just looking at microsatellite data, this is a structure plot, doesn't look quite as nice as the other ones I showed, but this is basically, again, we've got two populations, we've got the Uganda cob, the white-eared cob, each individual with that group with one or with the other. 
And what we find nicely is two populations as we expect. But they do not <coughs> match up with the subspecies. The Uganda cob is this population here. Genetically, we cannot tell the difference between the Uganda cob in Murchison Falls National Park and the white-eared cob. So it looks as if there is significant introgression moving in one direction. Morphologically, you can't tell them apart from, Uga from Uganda cob. Genetically, you cannot tell them apart from white-eared cob. So about, severe one-way introgression. How about behaviorally? Behaviorally, they are sedentary, so they're not migratory. But my, so migration, well, this is my own. Migration can evolve quite, I mean, that should be able to evolve quite quickly because, of course, all the <coughs> migrating species in the Serengeti don't migrate in other regions. So I think it, it, it's much to do with whether there's any, any fresh pastures year-round or not. Anyway, after we, we published this, um, someone uh, sent me an email with these two pictures, which are individuals from Metchison Falls National Park males, and they do look introgressed. They definitely look like they're admixed individuals. So it is going on. Right, so speciation, of course. Again, we have barrier gene flow, changes in, um, uh, in uh, climate. We've got barrier to the thick forest, they disappear, savannas uh, encroach, populations meet up, but they don't always interbreed. Reproduction, uh, there might be reproductive isolation, so we can say that the populations are, in essence, different species. So this is an example of some work we've done on Grant's gazelles. Now, these have a very limited distribution range. Actually, a lot of species have limited ranges to East Africa. You've got Grevy's zebra, for example, only found in this region. You've got lesser kudu. You've got desert warthog. There's also species of ostrich here. And I don't know if you, if you remember, I showed you the isoclines in the beginning, that East Africa has very high species diversity. Now, this is not only between species, but we also see it within species. So in Grand Scassel, again, we've got morphological differentiation. This is the Granti subspecies, four, four subspecies are recognised, and this is the Paterzi subspecies. I've written here they're either from Savo East or Savo West, and this is from one national park in southern Kenya, there's a big highway running through it, anything west of the highway is called Savo West, anything east of the highway is called Savo East. So they have morphological differences, there's a bit of a difference on the nose blaze and a bit of a difference in the rump pattern. So these guys are very, very close to each other. So we took samples from all over the country and from Tanzania. And what we see is three very differentiated groups. They're also geographically structured. The Paterci we only see in southeast Kenya. We have the Notata group from northern Kenya, and then we have the Granti group from the southwest. Now, in many species, now, okay, so a couple of things. These groups are very localized, so it looks as if they must have diverged within East Africa, because they are only found here. We also see this in Hata Beast, we see the same picture in Giraffe, we see the same picture in Sable Antelope, and quite an, a, a, a couple of species, I'll get back to that. But it definitely looks as if it's local divergence, and also there are no barriers to gene flow now, yet they don't interbreed. These guys are only 60 kilometers apart, and it doesn't look as if they interbreed. Right. Do you want to hear about zebra? Or <laughs> that's, that's, sorry, it will go very quickly. It was only if there was time. It's only because the pictures are very nice. So I press H. <coughs> right, so clinal variation. Of course, we get it if we just have differentiation over geographic scales. So if you're down in South Africa, you're more likely to mate with someone from South Africa. If you're up from the east, you're more likely to mate with someone from the east. Here we have a study of plain zebra. Now, plain zebra is distributed throughout East and Southern Africa. Here we've got the present day distribution again and our sample sites for this analysis. Just notice this individual down here, or this population down here, right down in south, uh, southwest southern, uh, South Africa. This is the quagga. Now, if any of you have not heard of that, I'll show you a picture of it now. We have huge morphological <coughs> variation within the zebra. The zebra of Kenya have black and white stripes as you move further south. They get shadow stripes, as you see here, population from Botswana, more of a, a, a brown background with the shadow stripes. And then finally, the quagga. Now, this has been recognized as its own unique species for a long time. This is the last remaining quagga. It died um, in 1870. Now, um, it has led uh, biologists to infer that there are six different, or rather five different, zebra uh, subspecies and then the one species of quagga. Again, we did genetic work on it, and what we see is there is no phylogeographic structuring in zebras mm. at all. This is the only species where we see this pattern. 
So when we look just at the quagga, they group within the plain zebra. So really, the quagga is not a species of, at least not based on mitochondrial DNA, and not a species in its own right. It's just a southern population of plain zebras. And then again, this is a structure plot. What we see here is not the differentiation that we see in many of the other species. We see clinal variation. And when we add on the 80 or rather the 90% confidence intervals, it's just a bit of a mess. It's just structuring only because they're geographically far apart from the south to the east. Right. So that's just an example of six of the studies. So, of course, now we have to extrapolate this and look at all 19 different species where phylogeographic work has been done. <coughs> now, when we compiled this data, we had to omit some species. For example, white rhinoceros is, all the global population of white rhinoceros is from one bottlenecked population of 20 to 50 individuals. So, all the white rhino we have in the world is from this one bot bottleneck population. So, using genetic data from that wasn't really um, informative in a phylogeographic respect. Same with the black rhinoceros, we only have samples from four different, or rather genetic data from four different populations, not informative. Puku, Grevy, Zebra, we only have from one locality. So these are the species where we have continent-wide, lots of samples, hundreds of individuals. Right, so what I've shown here, these are the 19 samples, uh, sorry, the 19 taxa. We've got, I don't know how much of this you can see, but the grey shading is their present day distribution. And we have the black max is where we have genetic data from. So um, overall, you can see that the most well-sampled regions are South and Eastern Africa. But we can say a little bit about Western Africa because we have data from the West, although not much. For example, water, water but we only have one population, cob, we only have two populations. But we can say some things. All of the individuals that have, where we have genetic data from the West, have phylogeographic structuring in the West. They have a distinct lineage in the West. Now, for some individuals, it's very localized, like in Hartebeest. For other species, it branches out to East and Southwest Africa, such as the buffalo. So I've just, um, I've just uh, plotted in the Western lineage in green. Now, all of these species that have Western lineages also have other lineages. Now, I've gone through the water park. We had a, a population in the Southeast. I've gone through the cob. We had a population in the East. Um, and then we have common warthog, for example, which has phylogeographic structuring in the west, the east, and the south. And if we go on to giraffe, we have additional, much like the impala, a phylogeographic signal in the southwest. So it looks as if there are four regions across species. Now, just looking only at the east, I showed you data from Grant's Gazelle. We have a lot of localized structuring, which... Um, it looks as if um, uh, uh, these species have um, become structured within East Africa. We see this signal, sable antelope, heart of East, giraffe, basa oryx, and even, I'll just get back to the hippopotamus. Now, from, from pollen data and from paleoclimate data in general, we know that um, climates in East Africa have been much more variable than they were in Southern Africa. Not only do we have the global impact of changing our sheets of the northern hemisphere, we also have local impact from the uplift of the Rift Valley, among other things. So this has given a lot of not only spatial heterogeneity, but also temporal heterogeneity. Um, and this, of course, will allow species <coughs> to show evolutionary innovation. It will allow species to diverge, to become multiple differentiated populations. But it will also um, be associated with a greater risk of extinction. And a lot of species we see a phylogeographic signal of the eastern populations being derived from the south. Now, we know from the fossil record that they've been there for hundreds of thousands of years, yet um, the genetic data show that it's a relatively recent expansion towards the east. And data from the hippo, so the hippo is heavily associated with water, of course. It's, a, it's an amphibian species. Um, and what we see, although we don't see multiple structuring in the east, we do see a signal of a recent expansion in the east. So, Hippo in the south are recently expanded from the east, so that could be um, some sort of, a, of, a, of an ecological um, reason for that. <coughs> also, we know from present-day data that drought is the, is the most, um, uh, or is the largest cause of mortality in East African parks. And the Pleistocene, what we so East Africa has um, some of the deepest lakes in the world, <coughs> and they have multiple times dried out and filled up 
during the Pleistocene. So there have been huge changes in temperature um, and in moisture. And we know that southern Africa has had a much more stable uh, moisture level throughout the Pleistocene. Just to show that a lot of the species are distributed along the east to south open formations of Africa, um, and some of them, they show different levels of divergence. The most diverged are the Beza oryx and the Chemsbok, and they were assumed to be one species until relatively recently, and their mitochondrial lineages differ by 40%. We've got eland antelope that I showed you, I don't even know where it is, here it is, where we've got the regional structuring, and then we've got all the way to plain zebra where we don't really see anything. But for those species where we don't really see anything, plains, greater kudu and impala, all of them have a phylogeographic signal in another region. Impala, kudu and zebra all have a pocket in southwest Africa. For zebra, it's the mountain zebra. Let me just go on, I think that's on the next slide. Yeah. Now, the southwest is a hyper-arid region, and it has high floral endemism. The um, Karoo Nab Namib um, plant um, diversity um, is all endemic to this region. So it makes sense that there would also be endemic uh, populations of these ungulates. Right, so finally, the final signature that we see is that a lot of populations that must have diverged in allopatry, they look different, they behave different, and um, genetically they're very different, have come into secondary contact. And we see a hybrid zone across species in East Africa. Now the exact locality of that hybrid zone differs depending on where the phylogeographic lineages come from. If the lineages are from West and East Africa, and they meet up in East Africa, the hybrid zone is quite far West. So, for example, in Buffalo and in Cobb, the hybrid zone is in Uganda. We also see a hybrid zone between forest and savanna elephant in this region, so it's quite a well-known, and for, for, for several bird species as well, it's quite a, a, a well-known area of transition. For those populations where we have <coughs> lineages that meet from the east and south, the hybrid zone is pushed further south. We see this in common warthog, for example, we see it in common eland, and in hartebeest. There, such as zones are further south in southern Tanzania. Now there's a bit of an arrow here, and this is just to show that for common warthog, we can see that the, the variation of the eastern uh, population lies within the variability of the south. So the population of the east are derived from the south. And finally, uh, we put all this together into one plot, which took a really long time to make. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just leave that there for two seconds. But I mean, so, so in general, what we see, oh no, I have some conclusions. Right, so the first one was just for the people coming from my group, that an ungulate <laughs> is a hoofed mammal. It's, that's why it's so nice to come down here, and, uh, and I, really, I have to say, I really enjoy coming down to MBZ because um, I, I, I work with mammals, and, um, and the guys upstairs work <coughs> a lot with computers, and um, so it's, it's very nice to come down here and talk organisms. No offence to the guys here from the lab. Anyway, ungulate, not a coffee, it's a hoofed mammal. Okay, so we see similar regional structuring across taxa and trophic levels. We see it from the first, we see it in plants. I mean, it's in, it's in direct evidence from a plant pathogen, but we see it in the C4 grasses, we see it in the ungulates, we see it in toads, we see it in, in, um, in white-tailed mongoose, for example, and then we see it in the apex predators that, of course, are rely on ungulate uh, biomass and density to survive. So across all traffic, trophic levels, we see definite structuring. It looks as if there have been areas of more or less stable savanna habitat in West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, and in Southwest Africa. And it's incredible that we see this structuring in so many species. I mean, it's such a clear signal. We have a such a zone in East Africa, a lot of phylogeographic, um, sorry, a lot of phylogeographic um, uh, lineages that have diversion and allopatry come into contact in this region, which is a very active uh, climate region as well. Very high diversity within and between species. We see a mosaic of refugia, likely in East Africa. That's why we see so many genetically and geographically distinct lineages in this region alone. And then it looks as if there's been a long-standing uh, refuge area in Southern Africa. We have much higher levels of genetic <coughs> diversity within populations than we have in the East. Um, and also from climate data, we know that this has been a more stable region than, um, than East Africa. 
Right, and finally, just acknowledgements, uh, uh, Rasmus Heller and Hans Sigismund, who are involved in this review as well. And then particular thanks to Peter Tander, who was um, my mentor when I, when I started uh, on this work. And he put in a huge amount of effort to develop the, interest, the infrastructure so that we could get samples for genetic analysis that have now um, been able to elucidate many of these issues of Pleistocene refugia in Africa. And I kept my time. Thank you for listening. <laughs> That's great. Any questions about the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so any questions, please? We have plenty of time. Did someone push the lights? There? I'm, I'm curious about the, the phenotypic variation in the plain zebra. You said that there was the ones where, you know, what I think of the zebras, the black and white stripes mm -hmm. were going all the way down to, was it the quagga? The quagga. Yeah. And, and you indicated those are some of the same species. What? Do you know what the, the difference in phenotype is due to? Is that genetic difference? I, I mean, yes, because it's heritable. So when you have populations in zoos of, uh, of zebra from one region or another, their offspring will look the same. Okay. So it is, it is heritable. Um, I mean, but that could be one locus. We do, it, but it, it, it's not, because we're looking at, not well, in theory, non-coding DNA. So if we looked at something um, that coded for um, um, coat color, then we might get a different signal. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> have you looked at any of the, the DICA data and seeing how that crosses with the No, I haven't. So I, open I only, habitat? No, I haven't. But the, so the DICAs, I mean, there's, also, there's so many species. I'm, I'm not familiar with the DICAs at all, but I just know that there's like s now 17 species or something yeah. of DICA. I mean, a lot of the, so I, I'm only familiar with Bettine's, uh, uh, her one uh, study yeah, one on red. Paper in yeah, and, and there's been, there's no, I know there is a guy working, guy in the UK is working one or two species, but that's local, so it's not uh, continent wide. So Hans hasn't started doing anything no. more? No, no. But that would be a future venue. Be very interesting. Yeah. Um, have you, you talked a little bit about some of the species um, expanding or contracting their, their populations. And is there any sort of um, kind of overall story about, uh, do you find that most of these different species are um, having similar demographic um, right. patterns of expan population expansion and contraction? Right. No. So, so the, the similar pattern we see is just sort of the regional structuring. So there are a lot of idiosyncrasies. I yeah. mean, they all have different life, uh, life history traits. Um, they're, all, they're, they're all associated with savannah. They, of course, have very different um, uh, um, evolutionary histories. Um, so no, but not also. So again, I mean, um, when you review papers over 15 years, I mean, so much has happened, and they don't all uh, they don't all look at the same issues. Sure. Some, for example, look at hybridization. Others look at you know it, it's very specific. So so not all papers, far from all papers, have looked at expansion. Mm -hmm. They may have looked at it, but they're not found anything, and therefore not written it up in the paper. So no, we don't see. I mean, also with the timing of these splits. We're not able to time it, so it's mitochondrial DNA data, and we don't have any. We don't have. I mean, only three of the 19 studies have tried to estimate um, split times, and they've used very, very different methods, and they're not rigorous. Okay. Well, I've I've done one of them, and it's not particularly rigorous. It's just using a fossil calibration, which isn't very certain. So we're not able to associate these splits with actual biotic or abiotic events. We can just see that they're there, and they're very deep for some species. What if you think about um, quantifying some kind of comparable metric of, po of some kind of aspect of population history, like whether it's effective population size or gene dispersal rates, even just using mitochondrial DNA and then seeing how, seeing whether there's phylogenetic structure in that. I'm just wondering and thinking about like that could suggest that there are certain types of life history or other traits that are sort of, that are shared among closely related species that cause them to, you know, in a macroevolutionary sense, kind of respond the same way. Right. Um, Right. You might be able to eyeball, I mean, I was trying to think about a, the different patterns phylogenetically when you were showing that slide, but I couldn't make any sense no, of it. No, I mean, I mean, we really spent a lot of time uh, look, I mean, looking, <laughs> looking at this, other than it looks very pretty, I think. That's only because I made it. But there's, I mean, there's, um, no, it's very, it's very, I mean, it's very difficult. It, you, I mean, and for some, you know, you have this colonization from the south, from others you have colonization from the north, from some you have east-west split. It's a, okay, so one difficult thing is also the taxonomy. So 
these we treat these as as one taxa. But now Hatter Beast in this new um, taxonomy uh, book that's come out, which has just caused an uproar in the ungulate community, is now eight species. In Pala is two species. Um, we didn't include um, elephant because it was one species, but now it's two species, and there isn't really any data which is only for one species, which is of high enough resolution. Um, giraffe is six species. You know, so, so it, it, it's just hugely difficult, because where do you start? Like, and on, what, and what, on what taxonomic level are you at? Well, potentially, you could even do that with, within a single region, right? You could say, like, northern Tanzania, and you're quantifying it for species that are actually within the same geographic region. But Yeah, maybe we should talk about that. It might be interesting. I mean, I think... It's very interesting these... whether, it was, whether there was a relationship or not. Yeah, yeah. So, Tell me a bit more about what's happening in Eastern Africa. So in the earlier slides, you were showing these sort of biome level reconstructions through time. Yeah. And it seemed to be it was inferring that East Africa was large, the savanna and maybe over woodland was largely replaced by right. dense forest. Yeah. Yet East Africa has the highest species diversity. Yeah. So is that because it's a suture zone or because there's local endemics plus invasion, yeah. recent invasion, yes. or all of the above? All of them. So, the, so it's, there's both the biogeographic lineages coming into secondary contact, and then there's also high local, uh, uh, local um, diversity. Okay, and do those petition between things that are more grassland or more open woodland? That's so is it mostly open grassland things that are coming in and meeting from somewhere else, and more retention of woodland, open That's, woodland type uh, things? I don't know. That, I haven't thought of that. The paleo model seems to suggest there wouldn't have been grassland there in the mid Holocene. Right, okay, so that, that's a super rough. Though. Oh, I, have I, to say I, that's I realize a super, how cool yeah, 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 yeah. So there, I mean, there's, there's um, yeah, I see, yeah, I don't know, I'd have to think about that. But I mean, one of the answers for some of that pattern is the Kalahari expanded along this arid, cor this, you know, arid corridor hypothesis, which links, directly links southern Africa with Tanzania. And then if you look at it today, that's largely disappeared as a consequence of montane forest expansion. So. And then forest expanded directly from the Awatine Rift across to the East African coast. So you've got both a closing in the north and a linkage in the south, and then a closing in the south and an opening in the north. And then that dynamic spins like this. So you get isolation and, and connectivity. And, and my last question, if I can be really cheeky, is um, <laughs> fossils. Isn't so how many of these tags are identifiable to species in the fossil record? Um, I know Africa's so got a wonderful mammal fossil record. So. Yeah, so, so most of the fossil work is from East Africa by, um, uh, I don't even, uh, Elizabeth Verber, and then I don't remember what the other guy's called. So all of them, I mean, they're, they're so, so that's also the problem is that, um, I mean, they all, pretty much all of these have first appearance dates in the, in the fossil record going back somewhere between um, 500 and 900,000 years, and they're pretty well established. But we have problems finding out where the splits are between the species, like at what time we have a most recent common ancestor <coughs> in the fossil record, for example, eland, or, or sorry, giant and common eland, or lesser and greater kudu. Um, so, so that's why we have difficulty putting a, a, a clock on our splits because well, we don't. About that, but just you know, oh, what right. tax are present when and where. And yeah, so that so that we have. Yes. Yeah, sort of stuff Tony's done with North America. Yeah, so there's a lot from East Africa. Not as much from South Africa, and I, I'm not familiar with work from West Africa. But it's, uh, it, it's again, it's mostly from East and Southern Africa, and most of that's from East. So, so oh. it's, that Lars Federman and his colleagues have been putting together a huge database of all the fossil occurrences, which will be served through the now database. Okay. Of Is he the guy who's done carnivore, lots of carnivore stuff as well, like plasticine he, carnivore? He, he has done a lot of carnivore Okay, stuff, right. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. There's another question up the bench. Yes. Yeah, so uh, have you noticed any kind of rules of thumb for which morphological, visible, coat pattern differences are meaningful in terms of probable genetic divergence and which ones are just noise? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not familiar enough with the very, with the, I mean, I've, I've been, I've spent a lot of time in East and Southern Africa. I've never been to West Africa. Um, uh, when you look at um, uh, when you look at field guide, it, it will not always uh, be hugely informative about the morphological uh, variation. So that is that I would have to be someone who knows their morphology or their phenotypes of, of 
have these two answers. I can't. I don't know. I mean, it's also sexual selection. What's important for a species is it a, a toilet seat on the bum or is it a nose glaze? I don't know. I don't know. Any other questions? All right. Well, that's a great introduction. Uh, Leonard is around for.